Hey, Dan, it's great to see you, and congratulations on a fantastic book. Thank you. Same to you and your fantastic book. Let's, we can talk about our fantastic books together. <laughs> this sounds good. Uh, now, let's start with uh, the big idea in your book. Uh, what I like, you know, there are so many books out there that are about what to do differently, how to do things differently. Uh, my book, Greater Work, is like that. It's about what you can change. Sure. Now, you have taken a completely different lens to the problem, which is the when. Right. That the timing matters a great deal. And there's a science, not an art to it. But there aren't a lot of people who take that lens. And why do you think that is, that there are so little attention paid to the when question? You know, that's a really good question. I haven't figured out an answer to that. Um, I think that at some level we're uncomfortable as human beings with, with the fact that we are temporal creatures. We have you know, biological clocks in every cell in our body, and we are, we are living in, in a temporal world. That is, we are moving, moving through time. And so maybe we're just not aware of that in the same way that a fish is the last mm -hmm. animal you talk to about understanding water. Right. Um, but as you say, you know, one of the ideas in, in this book, When, is that we take very seriously what, what we do, mm -hmm. uh, and we should. We take very seriously who we do it with. Mm. It's why we have HR departments. Mm -hmm. We take very seriously how we do things. It's why we, you know, you write about the importance of, of, of practice and learning. That's incredibly important. But for some reason, we take this question of when we do stuff and say, ah, it's not that important. But it is. It's not, I don't think it's more important than those other things, but I think it's as important. Mm -hmm. no, it's a completely different lens, and I got so many surprises from your book. Thanks. Now, in, in business or in workplaces, uh, there are a lot of change initiatives yeah. that's going on. Uh, what can we change? How can we do things better? Right. So in my study, there were the best performers had changed how they approached their work. Uh -huh. There was a high school principal who had come in and flipped the classroom, right. which is homework at, at school, and right. you do the lecture via video right. at home. And what at, prompted at, him to do that? Uh, because it was underperformance, right? And now, th that is a what question. How can we do things differently? What and how? Now, the question then is, is when? When should you be doing things? And I know you have some fascinating results around schools, for example, that, that make a big difference. Oh, yeah. So if you think about high schools, I mean, mm -hmm. one, of the th one of the things that's just uh, an abomination in America is, this, is start times for teenagers. Mm -hmm. uh, the research shows pretty clearly, well, what we know about our chronobiology is that uh, some people are mm -hmm. larks, some people are owls, yeah. some people are in the middle. Um, but there is an age factor in all of that. Mm -hmm. So when people hit about age 14 mm -hmm. through 24, they become very much late night mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. owls. Um, and it's not because they're late. I have a 15 year old, it's not because he's lazy, it's right. because he's 15. And, um, and yet, we start school painfully early for these, mm -hmm. for these kids. And so you have the American Academy of Pediatrics a few years ago issuing a policy statement mm -hmm. saying, do not start school for kids, teenagers, before 8.30. And yet, the average school start time is 8.03. So again, it's, it's to your point about how things are not, uh, how we don't take uh, these when questions nearly right. as seriously. But, uh, but on the change things, so what have you found about what are the elements that allow groups and institutions and organizations to change? So one is that if you are underperforming, it right. gives the impetus for change. Right. And another thing is that you're looking for uh, value. Can you do it better? So not change for its own sake, but can you actually improve the value? In other words, the beneficiaries of right. that change. And those are the kind of the drivers of that. Right. Uh, but it's, it's very much of a what and a how question. Sure, yeah. And, and, and business is full of that. How can you make progress? Now, what I found, though, is that it's very often the case that you add things, more activities, more projects, more of everything, as opposed to taking away things. And that's what I, I, I found this uh, nurse in Norway mm -hmm. uh, who was trying to fix the problem that the, uh, the people in the elderly home were malnourished. They, were too, they didn't weigh enough. They couldn't get enough food. So he was thinking, maybe I should start a, a nutrition program. Mm -hmm. or we should get them to eat more. But then he had a, a when application. So he said, the problem here is the timing of the meals. Uh -huh. He changed the timing of the meals and then they weighed the patients, or the, the, the people in the home before and after, right. and they gained the weight that they needed. Wow. Just, Just because they pushed the dinner uh, two hours later. Oh, right? uh -huh. they, it was not, it was right. delivered too early and then they needed it for the night so they could actually have a good, right. good uh, night's sleep. Right. So again, it's that when question. Now, th th the one thing I found in your book that is fascinating, it's a science around restorative breaks. Sure. And somehow we don't take those breaks. Uh, in school or at work, and and you even introduce the idea of a nap, and I, you know, if you say that, well, believe me, the nap, the nap has been, naps have been around before I got to it. Yeah, that's true. But the science of naps yeah, 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 and yeah. why it actually is yeah. beneficial, yeah. Yeah. 
And I'm just thinking if you're sitting in drilling motors or in Chevron or any of these large companies and you come with, with a NAV problem, <laughs> you're probably going to be run out of there, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but why is that? It makes so much sense yeah. when I read your book. Yeah. Have breaks. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. There, I think there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a lot there. And, and it goes to, in some ways, how organizations change and how organizations change within a broader context. Um, so if we, so let's, let's start there. So there were some things that, were, that seemed, in, in the U.S. experience, seemed absurd not that long ago. Family, family leave, mm -hmm. okay? So um, uh, maternity leave. Uh, that was not a norm in this country until very, very recently, all right? Because the idea, well, that's crazy. What, she gets to come back to work? It's like, we're gonna, you're, 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 you're leaving the job. You're, well, well that's, that's crazy. That's, 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 that's a peculiar thing. And then we introduced paternity leave. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, the guy didn't even have the baby and he gets time off. Right. And so these things end up migrating from the edge more toward the mainstream. If you even, even think about the rise of th something like casual uh, dress uh, in certain offices. Uh, at a time unheard it was like of, yes, unheard of. Yeah. And then there was a little uh, move, casual Fridays. You're, you and I are both older. I remember, remember that. Casual yeah. Fridays. <laughs> okay, so we got a little bit in there. And now it's like, oh, maybe people should wear whatever they want. Right. So I do think these things migrate. Now on, on NAPS, um, uh, you know, I'm a convert on this because I, I used to not like NAPS. I, if, if I napped, I always felt bad afterwards. Bad physically, also bad morally, as if I you know, was shirking. Um, and I realized that the secret to naps, and, and this comes out very clearly in the research, is short naps. Naps be of between 10 minutes and 20 minutes give us the restoration mm -hmm. without the, the downdraft of the, what's called sleep inertia, that groggy feeling. And so uh, 10, minute, 10 to 20 minute naps are, are ideal. And so there are some companies now, they're companies on the edge, um, like they're in Silicon Valley or are they somewhere else? They're in Silicon, they're, they're, they're Silicon Valley-esque. So you have something like Zappos, which is not in Silicon right. Valley, but is in, yes. you know, but is Silicon Valley-esque. You have Uber, which is in, or I guess it's in San Francisco. Um, and so some of these places are Ben & Jerry's, Vermont, which is the moral equivalent of San Francisco. And you have uh, these places um, introducing, you know, napping, allowing people to have, allowing people to have naps. The key point here, again, to broaden it out, is that, um, the research is overwhelming. We should be taking more breaks, and we should be taking certain kinds of breaks. The, the way to think about this, at least the way I do, is um, that breaks are not a deviation from performance. They're part of performance. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And it's interesting, yeah, so the NAP is just one particular way yeah. of doing that, right? And the, uh, I mean, it makes sense because you have all these workers sitting in the afternoon in particular, yeah. according to your research, um, and they, you might waste three hours in front of the computer. Yeah. Before you know it, you wake up and you say, wow, that's three hours. I got I nothing done. Do. Yeah. Nothing done and a 20 minute break. Yeah. Now, it's interesting. You also talk about sort of the meals of the day. Yeah. I mean, I grew up thinking that the breakfast is the most important meal. So did I. And, um, and you say. And if you look at the research on is answering, the, look at research that goes at this question. Is breakfast the most important meal of the day? The research answer to that question is a definitive maybe. Right? It's, it's, not, right. it's not clear uh, for a whole set of complicated reasons. Yeah. Uh, not super complicated, but, but a lot of the research are observational studies mm -hmm. that show that, oh, um, people who eat breakfast are healthy. Oh, that's nice. But it could be just because healthy people chose to eat breakfast. Right. Exactly. Um, and so, um, but the research on lunch is actually really interesting. Um, it's, and again, we have to put it in context that lunch is another kind of a break. And so I think if you look at it, I mean, you know, you teach at an MBA program, so um, so think about it in, in like uh, finance and investing terms. I would say I would I would I would short breakfast and go long on lunch. Right. I think that lunch is <laughs> breakfast is overvalued. Lunch right. is undervalued. Exactly. Uh, no, it's interesting. So I lived in Paris for a while, uh -huh. and I lived in a business district. Yeah. And they during lunch, all these people poured out. Yeah in groups, yeah. having lunch for maybe 45 minutes. Yeah. I mean, this is modern yeah, France, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not with wine and yeah, so yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. And after 45 minutes, they'll go back. Yeah. And I was looking at that saying, that's you know, a waste of time. Uh, so I was wrong. Yeah, I, listen, I'm, I was wrong too. I'm a, I'm a sinner on that. What I, what I uh, and I had it really wrong, it, that my view is that amateurs take breaks and professionals don't. Mm -hmm. And it's the exact opposite. We yeah. know that from, we know that from um, uh, how, uh, athletes. Uh, we know it from, I know you wrote, um, one of your chapters in your book deals with something akin to deliberate practice. We know that from Anders Ericsson's right. studies of violinists, um, that, that the elite violinists actually take more breaks than the, the people who are less elite. Right. They see intensity when you are working and then you take breaks. Exactly. That's the idea. Exactly. 
and, and we tend to do the opposite. Right. right? We, we said we don't have time to right. stop. We've got to jam more right. stuff in, right. and we don't realize that you actually the paradox is you get less done, probably, yeah. if you work that way. Right. Uh, so that's uh, I mean, it's super interesting how we can redesign the flow of the day right. to get more done. But, when you, but, but when you, you're, one of your principles is that we should be doing less. Mm -hmm. So how does, how does that work into the design of the day? Not only the temporal aspect of it, but just over the sort of like the, the metaphysical architecture of work. Well, the problem is that a lot of people take on too many things, too many yeah. assignments. Right. And what they do is that they, um, they stress to get everything done. Uh -huh. So they start out in the morning and they go all the way to night and then they go to that conference call. They had to dial in at 11 p.m., you know, with Asia. I've been there, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're all in doing that. And the problem is that the quality of work, it's not exceptional work, right. you know, it, it suffers. So the principle is that if you can do fewer things, right. you can do them much better. Right. And you've got, of course, you're going to figure out what really counts. Right. You should be working on the wrong things, obviously. But if you can find what you should focus on and go all in on those things. Right. So it means that you're still working hard. Right. I mean, people in my data, they are not slackers. Right. I do less doesn't mean being a slacker. Right. They're putting an average of 50 hours per week of work, and that's right. quite a hard work. Right. But it doesn't mean that somebody who's working 90 hours is going to beat somebody who's working 70, and somebody with 8 is going to beat somebody 60. Right. At, the, at those numbers, right. it is how you work, how much, not how much you work. Right. Is, right. is really the idea. And so, what, but, but in, the, in the ground truth of someone's experience on the job, how does that happen? Is it something the individual commands on his or her own? Is it something that is done in collaboration with a boss? Right. How, how it's a combination happen? of those yeah. two things. Uh, one is to have your own self-discipline uh -huh. to the extent that you have autonomy in your job. Right. And you know important. from right, your right. prior yeah, work that important. autonomy yes. is important. Yeah, absolutely. So if you have autonomy, at least some autonomy, you can decide what you do. The second then is, of course, is your boss. And if you have this, one of these pesky do more bosses who cannot prioritize and they just right. give you everything, you got a problem. And you right. need to push back on your boss and say right. no. Right. So you got to kind of manage others right. and you need to manage yourself. Right. And the other sin that's going on in companies days is, or in organizations, is too much collaboration sometimes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is that you get asked to, to join too many task forces, too many yeah. committees, and so yeah. on. And that means that you're spreading yourself thin right. because you're saying yes to too many things. Right. So that's going on. Now I want to uh, just move to another uh, topic, which is uh, team meetings. Okay. I mean, the way people work you know, now is through meetings to a large extent, right? And people hate you meetings. Th <laughs> you know, what's, what's it, are there MBA courses in meetings? No. I don't even know. Though they spend, I mean, even though these, you, the, your, your students are going to go into the world of work yep. and spend most and spend a huge portion of their days in meetings. There is uh, social psychology research, as you know, on uh, group, group dynamics. dynamics. Sure, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But how, how do we run meetings? Yeah. You know, people don't research meetings because, you know, being the meeting guru, yeah. It's not really seen as a... I guess so. Maybe it's not a path to tenure. A path to tenure, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's one of the most important ways that people work today, right. how these meetings are run. But here is a fascinating thing from, uh, from your book, which is when should we schedule certain meetings? Yeah. So one principle in my book is when you, have, you should run really rigorous, heated debates in meetings mm -hmm. to let the best arguments win. It's mm -hmm. a difficult thing to do. But I never thought of when those meetings should take place. So would you suggest morning, midday, or in the evening? Depends on what you're debating, I think, yeah. uh, in part. It depends on what you're debating and, 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 and who's there. So what we know from some of this research is that um, people do analytic work better in their peak period, which for most of us is the morning. So if, you're, if, it's, an, if it's an analytic um, uh, question, so you're, you're, you're looking at um, you have projections for next quarter's numbers, and you're figuring out, oh, do we need to do we need to uh, alter our something in our logistics, or uh, something in our supply chain, or or something like very very hard headed like that? Then I think having that argument in the morning is actually a good idea because you have people who are right. who are analytical. Um, in the recovery period, which again for most of us is later in the day, I'm leaving out the owls here for a moment. The recovery period, which is later in the day, um, that ends up that's an interesting combination because we have elevated mood but less vigilant, so it could be better for brainstorming. So for brainstorming kinds of iterative meetings, maybe you want to have those later in the day. The, 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 the confounder is that when you have people of different chronotypes, then you're going to have people in different, different, uh, different, different places there. Right, so when you have the owls, as right. you call them, like I'm just thinking of a bunch of software engineers yeah. 
that you know they code until 2 a.m. and they come in right. at like uh, 10 a.m. Right. You don't want to have them at an eight o'clock. You don't want to have right. them at an eight o'clock. Uh, at, you don't want to have them at an eight o'clock meeting. Uh, but I, I think it's now the, the one question I have though is, is that regardless of the and the other thing is they don't do important meetings at two in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. That's another that's another factor. I uh, talked to somebody at this one company. It's like oh we did, we we just uh, you know we did our uh, a product feedback meeting right. um, and and it was really kind of lackluster. Like no one really said anything. And, it's like, and I said what it was and she said two and it's like uh, okay. But you know what the most amazing that, yeah. thing is that we schedule meeting when people are available. Absolutely. Right? We just say, when can you meet? Right. And we have an important meeting, and we might get at 2 p.m. because people are available, which right. is a really strange criterion if it, you think about it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an absurd criteria in, in a way. It's, it's, it's almost insulting in, in, in a sense. And so I, I think that the whole idea of meetings is, is actually very problematic. If you talk to, as you have, talk to people who are doing the individual work inside of organizations, and they know, for instance, that there's a certain period of, they have an intuitive sense that there's a certain period of the day when they're good at doing their work, mm -hmm. but they're stuck in meetings all the time. Right. So you stick people yeah. in their peak period, they're in meetings all the time, then they're released from the meeting and all of a sudden, like, their best period, their best period is gone. So I think, it's, I think it's a question of being intentional there. Now, the one question I have for you on these, on these debates is, do you, is, is there a concern that those, these intense public debates disadvantages certain people, people who might be more introverted, people who might be less um, verbally glib? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and that's the job of the manager who's yeah. running the meeting, yeah. is to be inclusive. Yeah. And it's very easy to let the loudest person Abs or the I've extrovert seen that so many times. dominate yeah. the yeah. meeting. Yeah. And then you have people with good idea or yeah. dissenting voices. Exactly. They don't get heard. Right. They don't speak up. Right. And it's the job of a leader to make sure it is safe to speak up and that everybody's included. Right. Now, there are techniques for that. I mean, one would be to uh, kind of call call them or warm yeah. call them. or What's a, What do you mean by warm call? Warm call means uh, this is kind of a technique from, uh, from the classroom, uh -huh, uh -huh. which is that you want to hear from some students, uh -huh. but you know they're reluctant to speak yeah. up. So you go before the meeting, before the classroom, and you say, you know, I'm thinking about oh, calling God, you. Oh, that's great. I well, like you, got a, you got a great point. I know you got a great yeah. point. And at a certain moment, I would like you to kind of, great. Uh, I will uh -huh. call on you or let you speak to that point in right. the meeting. Right. And then you're preparing the individual. Right. As opposed to coming out of the, you know, <laughs> nowhere and saying, hey, yeah. you know, right. that's a warm call. Right. Uh, so those are techniques, and it's a job of the leader. And the danger is that if you let the other types of people speak, is that they dominate the conversation and no dissenting voices. Exactly. Or no flawed assumptions are right, surfaced. Right. And then you're going down the wrong path. You make right. the wrong decision. Right. And uh, then you yes. also write about the technique once you, you have the debate, a, a, a debate theoretically should end with a resolve at some right. point. What happens yeah. then? I mean, you want to have, you know, it's a twin technique of fight and unite, as uh -huh. I call it. Some companies call it disagree and commit. Right. Okay, sure. Uh -huh. mean, it shouldn't be a debating society. Fight and unite is so much better because yeah. it rhymes. Right. <laughs> there you go. And we know about processing fluency of rhymes. Right, now, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So fight and unite means that after a certain point in time, you need to make a decision. Now, it shouldn't necessarily be consensus, uh, but it should be made. And then the team has to unite behind a decision. Right. Now the paradox is a little bit that if you haven't included people, if they feel left out, it's not a fair process. Right. And we know from research, if people don't think that process was fair, yeah. they will not come Absolutely. in. Absolutely. So there is a benefit of getting the inclusion up front. Absolutely. They will commit down the line. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. A lot of work is done through projects. People get sure. into a project. Right. And when they get to the finish line, they work like mad to kind of meet the deadline. Right. And, but you talk about, in terms of timing of a project, this importance of a midpoint. Yeah. And either that can be a surge yeah. or it, you can slip. Sure. And how do you manage these midpoints that are so important? Yeah. So there are all kinds of effects of midpoints in, in a lifespan, in the course of mm -hmm. a project, uh, even in the course of, there's some good experimental evidence in the course of even giving somebody a task that they mm -hmm. will actually be less diligent, less conscientious in the middle of the task than at the beginnings mm -hmm. and the ends, so a sort of U-shaped curve. But um, on, the, on, on projects, there's some research, um, this is now almost, this is not 25 years old, uh, from Connie Gersick, uh, showing that midpoints have this particular effect on how projects um, evolve, how projects work. And what we had is this vision that, that projects moved, we had a beginning, and then groups moved steadily mm -hmm. in a linear way toward the end. And as with many phenomena in life, it's not linear. It's, it's a form of punctuated equilibrium 
where you have nothing that happens, and then boom, all of a sudden something happens. And what, what, what Gersick found in a really eerie way is that that sudden burst of activity seemed to occur right around the temporal midpoint. So 34-day project, day 17. 11-day mm -hmm. project, day 6. Half-hour project, 29th minute. Mm -hmm. And um, there was, this, there was this, um, this idea that groups would look at the clock, sometimes literally, because she had people videotaped, um, or would, would actually bring the time aspect, and she was audio taping, videotaping all these. So they'd say, oh no, we're on day blah 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 of this project, we better get going. And there's something about hitting that midpoint that can, that can fire us up. That sudden burst of activity that occurs, um, where, where I think people say, oh my gosh, we've squandered half of our time, we gotta get going. So what should a manager do to make sure that you actually get that surge, or people are not saying, oh boy, we're behind and then we're gonna yeah, I, I think it's I think it's I think it's one I think it's two things. Number one is that I, I think that it's arguable whether that's the natural course of projects, mm -hmm. okay, in the way that mm -hmm. we know that because it, there, what what Gersick was doing was analogizing from evolution, mm -hmm. and evolution we we typically before the 1970s believed right. was steady, but instead uh, uh, Eldridge and mm -hmm. Stephen Jay uh, Eldridge and Gould said no, it's punctuated, mm -hmm. stasis, poof, spark, stasis, mm -hmm. poof, spark. So if that is the natural, I, I would say, don't try to push people too hard at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Let them do that kind of preliminary, um, um, uh, I don't know, some, some of it's posturing, but some of it's alignment, et cetera, et cetera. But I would, I would do one, two things. One, make that temporal midpoint salient, okay? Say, hey, this is a 30-day project, we're on day 15, we gotta get going. Um, and the other thing is that I think there's some good evidence, both in terms of data analysis and also in terms of experimental evidence showing that if people feel like they're a little bit behind, they're going to be more motivated. And you see this with some big data research on uh, halftime scores in NBA games. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also see it, um, it you know, some, some causality in some of the experimental research mm -hmm. that shows if you and I play, if I'm playing a game against, it's, it's usually not against a real person, but I'm, let's say I'm playing a game and the game has two halves, and I'm playing this game on a computer against an anonymous opponent, and the researchers say to me either, you're way ahead, you're way behind, or you're a little bit behind. My performance only goes up in one of those. Yeah. It's when I'm a little bit behind. Yeah, a little behind, yeah. I suppose if you're too much behind, you sort of give up, yeah. more or less. Yeah, understand. And if you're too far ahead, you, so you can get right. complacent. So, so for a manager, what is so, it? So, 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 so be aware, yeah. um, make the midpoint salient, yeah. and then t tell your team, hey, you're behind. a little bit behind. Yeah, a little behind. Okay, so that's a good kind of management techniques. Again, it's about the timing and the, how it, right. the project is, is kind of um, flowing. Um, what have, what have you found, though, in, in, the, in the evolution of, of projects? So I did not study the, the project and the evolution of uh -huh. the timing. Yeah. I study more what, what are the, the good hallmarks of a, of a project. And again, it's back to one of these debate that you need to have enough time to debate the issues. Right. And I'm thinking and I'm linking it to what you found is that maybe in that early phase, one of the problems with projects is that they try to run too fast. They go to task too early, yeah, prematurely exactly. select exactly. the course of option. Exactly. And because they are on this treadmill. Right. And it might very well be that in the beginning of a project, you should actually slow down to speed up, so to speak. That there's a bit of time, but at the midpoint, you've yeah. got to get your yeah. act together. See, I think, that, I think that's right. And it's, it's a very hard proposition to prove, but I think that there's something organic about that. Mm -hmm. That it is the sort of the nature of the beast that it moves in that nonlinear way, mm -hmm. and 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 um, and it seems like if you let people operate just on their own, that seems where they where they naturally where they naturally go to. Now, whether it's the best way, I'm not sure, yeah. but I do think that the error that most project managers make is it's like a race. You know, it's like a long distance mm -hmm. race. If you go out too fast in the beginning. Yep. You're, you will implode. Yeah. There was a piece of academic research where they looked at a, a set of projects, and uh, some of them uh, started with uh, team bonding. Uh -huh. They spent time getting right. to know each other, right. which meant that they didn't get to task soon enough. Right. And the others just went right to task. Right. And then there's sort of like a race, and you see, okay, who's going to finish first uh -huh. and, and with the best quality? Right. And it was clearly the category. Interesting. People that took the time up front. Right. right. It's the idea of slowing down a bit right. to, to speed up. Right. And so it's very interesting how much, how people's tendency to go to task too soon. I, I made that mistake myself in my project. Mm. I want to switch to uh, one of your earlier books, Drive. Mm -hmm. And in that book, you talk about purpose. 
Now, of the seven key factors that played a role in explaining performance in my right. study, this thing I call P squared, the combination of passion and purpose. Mm -hmm. People who had that combination, they performed much better than those who did not. Right. But there was a twist to it, and that was that purpose was far more important than passion yes. in explaining the difference. Yes. Now, purpose and, and passion are different. Yeah. Purpose is about oh, yeah. do what contributes, yeah. and passion is about what excites you. It's exactly. like a hedonistic quality. Absolutely, it's it's totally in, it's totally right. inward it's directed. You. Yeah. And did that surprise you? That finding uh, that pa purpose is so much more important than passion. If you want to see who performs, I tell you what. When I read that, I was delighted. I mean, I mean, uh, forget about the in my, sort of my intellectual response. My visceral response mm -hmm. was delight, and the reason for that is that I have always been skeptical of this constant drumbeat about passion and find your passion mm -hmm. and all that. I've always been mm -hmm. skeptical about that because I think when you look at how people live their lives, um, it, 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 it's just a little bit off. So if someone says to me, um, you know, are you passionate about, I'm a writer, are you passionate about writing? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, because writing is really, really hard. Yeah. Okay, it's really, really hard. Some days are really mm -hmm. awful. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, if you say that, is that your passion? I don't know. Um, but I have a purpose behind it right. in that I've tried, I want to figure stuff out mm -hmm. and I want to explain it to other people. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps me going. Mm -hmm. And so, so I was delighted to sort of have the, that passion be less important mm -hmm. than, than purpose. And I mm -hmm. think I'm with you 100%. There's, I think there's just a pile of research out there showing the importance of a sense of purpose. And one of the things that I got mm -hmm. wrong in the book that you mentioned, mm -hmm. the, the drive book, was, and I've recalibrated my view of it, is... I always I, I have two notions of purpose right now. Uh, one of them is I call capital P purpose. The right. other one is small p purpose. Capital P purpose mm -hmm. is solving the climate crisis, doing all that. But but small p purpose is just mm -hmm. you know delivering for a teammate or yeah. or and putting a, something good right. for a customer. Yeah. And the small p purpose is what we found studying these individuals. They might have fairly trivial jobs on yeah. on, on the surface, right. but they they have found a purpose. Yeah. For example, uh, we have a case study of a woman who is a concierge in a hotel. Okay. It's her love of life, but she also sees it as purposeful. Right. Because she is helping people. Absolutely. Have a, 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 they come and visit. This is in Quebec. And yeah. they, it's an ability for her to show the city and make them have a good time in their important vacation. Right. right. Now, that is purpose. There's no question purpose. about it. And, 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 and what I got wrong is, is that I had mm -hmm. really isolated purpose as that. As the big P. As the big P. And the small P for, is equally important. The other mm -hmm. thing is that it's much more accessible to people. Because in our day-to-day -day work mm -hmm. lives, like, oh, what are you going to do today? Oh, I'm going to go in and solve the climate right. crisis. I'm going to go feed the hungry. Like most of us don't have that at our fingertips. Right. I also think that there's something in that, in, in terms of um, the, the purpose, passion, um, um, tension, is that I think there's something about purpose that is, I'm going to go abstract on you here for a second, that is existential, in that, mm -hmm. that, that small p purpose, the kind of purpose that, that is animating the concierge mm -hmm. and, the, and mm -hmm. some of the other people that you write about, is... Um, I think people want to know that if they didn't show up to work, someone would care and something wouldn't get done. Yeah. That, 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 their, that their work actually right. matters. Yeah. And, that, you know, and I, I think there's this fear that mm -hmm. you don't matter. Right. So if I, showed, if I didn't show up to work, would anybody notice? Mm -hmm. Would something not get done? Mm -hmm. Do I matter? Mm -hmm. And I think that existential mm -hmm. question is answered. I don't think that existential question is answered through passion. I think that existential question is answered through, through purpose. No, I mean, if, and I am if, glad that you have right. the data to, to show yeah, that. And if all, if all you have is passion and you show up at work and you're not there, then people aren't going to miss you. I mean, you're the only one who's going to be missing. Right, you'll <laughs> miss it. Getting your passion yeah. you know, fixed. Right, right. And, and, and that's why purpose is important. I mean, I hope that in commencement speeches, we get less of this, you know, follow your passion. I, and more like, you know, what's your purpose in yeah, life? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 the, the question for young people, what's your passion? I detest that question. Mm -hmm. I've always detested that question. It drove me nuts anytime anybody uh, asked me it. I think it's the exact wrong right. question. Should I think you, asking people what's your purpose what's is your a good purpose? question. Yeah. Um, I think also asking people even a quieter question of, okay, what is it you, what do you do? What do you do when nobody is mm -hmm. watching? What do you do right. as an expression of, of who you are? Mm -hmm. um, and um, so if, you, if, if there's one great triumph of this book, mm -hmm. Your book, Morton, it's it's that we're gonna we're gonna value purpose more than passion, and maybe we can start. You know, I'm sure you'll get some uh, commencement speech invitations. You can start beating the drum on that. In, yeah, for these it's not going to start with passion. Yeah. Um, the and I also hope that managers and leaders 
finally can start really taking seriously managing or leading with purpose. Yeah. And I like this idea of the small p purpose. Uh, yes, okay, we are here to, to solve big problems, but also all, you know, all employees around in a company or organization. Yeah. How can you as a manager help them you know, uh, have a purpose? Absolutely. And, and, and I think that is missing a lot. The, the other way I look at it is two, two different questions. Capital P mm -hmm. purpose is, am I making a difference? Cap, small p purpose is, am I making a contribution? Mm -hmm. Mm. And a contribution could be to your teammate, contribution could be to a customer, contribution could be smaller, Absolutely. smaller, yeah. Yeah. quieter, but still essential. Absolutely. And more, more important than right. anything else, at the fingertips of people in the day-to-day -day truth of mm -hmm. their work. Right. Absolutely.